Okay, 1 Corinthians, uh, let's open to 1 Corinthians chapter, uh, chapter one, please. And uh, we're still in chapter one, we're doing a, uh, as I said, this is our third lesson in the series, if you, the first time you've been in this class. And uh, we're, uh, we're not doing line per line, but we're, uh, you know, I'm selecting s different topics as we work our way through uh, 1 Corinthians, a lot of interesting topics in this, uh, in this uh, series and in this uh, book. Uh, before we uh, start the lesson from the text, I'd like to read to you a description of some popular television programs being rerun. You know, they're always doing reruns on various channels. And I'm not making this up, I'm just reading straight from the TV Guide, okay? So I just copied this out of TV Guide. So uh, the, first one is from, um, the first one is from Friends, a popular show that was on NBC. And this is how they describe it. They say, the characters of the popular Friends series imagined the various sexual combinations they could have had in a what-if dream sequence. Situations include threesomes, and more. That's, that's the TV guide describing it. Another show that uh, is on called Veronica's Closet. This was a series, a television series from the year 2000 with uh, Kirstie Alley. And it's also being broadcast uh, in repeats. And it describes one of the episodes in the following way. Again, I'm pulling this right out of TV guide. Josh continually denies his homosexuality even though he constantly flirts with Kevin, the wedding coordinator for his wedding. Josh's fiance, also enamored with Kevin, faxes him a picture of herself in the nude. TV guy. Um, another show, Dancing with the Stars, that's a, a program that's on now. Uh, and speaking of Kirstie Alley, you know, she was on that program last year. This year, this particular program, Dancing with the Stars, boasts two new stars who will be featured. One of them is Carson Kressley. Carson Kressley is an openly gay man, openly um, avowed homosexual, and he was the host for a TV program called Queer Eye for the Straight Guy, where homosexual um, uh, uh, designers you know, uh, would help heterosexual men kind of spruce up their wardrobe. That was the idea of the show. And another uh, 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 a star that's on this year is Chastity Bono. She's the daughter of Cher and she underwent surgery to become a man. And now she goes by the name Chaz Bono and she'll be there uh, dancing, I, my question was, is she going to be dancing with a woman or a man? But they tell us she'll be dancing with a man. Have you had enough descriptions? Shall I go on? Ooh. This is TV Guide. This, we're not talking about Playboy. This is just straight out of TV. I just pulled it out of TV Guide. And I mentioned these because this phenomena of loose public sexual immorality is nothing new. You know, I read some shows from 2000, I'm reading about shows from 2011, nothing, nothing's changed, actually it's gotten a little worse. In Paul's letter to the Corinthians, and you were wondering when's he getting back to the Bible, <laughs> in Paul's letter to the Corinthians, he deals with the same kind of problem, that's my point. You know, we're always thinking, oh boy, everything is so terrible nowadays. You know, 2,000 years ago, Paul was dealing with exactly the same problem of loose sexual morality. And there was a reason. The Gentiles, or the Gentiles who had become Christians in that church, had a very different background when it came to sexual conduct than their Jewish brethren. The Jews had been schooled, had been trained for centuries you know, in, in morality and so on and so forth. They had much higher standards as far as sexual morality is concerned, but the Gentiles, boy, when they were baptized, they brought a lot of their habits, ideas with them into the church. Many of these Gentiles were familiar with the practice of having sex with temple prostitutes. And Paul actually refers to a case 
of incest actually going on in the church where a man has his father's wife in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, 1 to 3. I mention this just to say that you know, they had their share of sexual immorality, public sexual immorality back in the first century and had problems with it in the church. So all kinds of problems in that society as well as the church at that time. And nothing has changed. You know, I could go on to describe in the TV guide show after show. I could go on online to look at movie reviews, movie after movie that have all one common denominator regardless of their characters, regardless of the storyline. Each one of these programs, and I'm not saying all television, obviously, I'm not making a blanket statement here. There are some good shows on TV and there are some good movies, but so much of it today condone and promotes fornication as something that is normal and consequence free. You see, every program and situation I described to you before in my opening statement, whether it included the free and friendly sex on Friends, I mean, Friends went for many, many years that show and eventually was exhausted. They had no ideas because everyone in the show had slept with everyone else. The storylines had nowhere to go. Or the homosexual and lesbian stories on other shows or the nudity or transgender characters and live-in sex repeated endlessly in movie after movie after movie. All these forms of sexual identity and activity come under the umbrella of a single word in the Bible. Just one word describes it all. And that word is fornication. Actually, <clears throat> fornication is not truly an English word. It's one of those strange words. Uh, the Greek word, the New Testament is written in the Greek language, most of it is. The Greek word for illicit sex in the New Testament was the word porneia. And this word was first translated actually into Latin, or the Latin Vulgate um, version of the Bible. And when it was translated into the Latin, it became fornicare, fornicare, which, mean, which actually meant a brothel. Now when English translators uh, began working on the book, the translation appeared, they took the, the Latin word fornicare and it became the English word fornicate. In other words, it was a transliter not a translation, but a transliteration of a Latin word and we got the word fornicate. And so the English word fornicate uh, came to represent all forms of illicit or forbidden sexual practices um, in the Bible, including adultery, which is sex outside of marriage by a married person, uh, homosexuality, which is sex between two men and two women, pedophilia, sex between an adult and a child, pornography, depiction of sex in print or film or live shows, uh, prostitution, the sale of sex, uh, bestiality, sex between humans and animals, and so on and so forth, all the forms of illicit sex. In other words, fornication is sexual immorality and sexual immorality is sexual activity outside the boundaries of marriage. Now, I've gone into a little bit of detail here about this word because there's such a permissive attitude today about fornication. And sadly, even among Christians. Thankfully, among Christians, we still see the seriousness and the sinfulness of various types of fornication. You know, as Christians, we still see adultery, for example, or homosexuality, certainly pedophilia. You know. We see these things as you know, uh, wrong and sinful. But there seems to be a greater acceptance of sexual intimacy and sexual intercourse by men and women outside of marriage. We, we tend to think, well, it's not so bad. What's the problem? A big one. Huh? A big one, yeah. <laughs> well, basically, it seems that Christians are as opposed as ever to unfaithfulness in marriage and certainly sexual perversion but it seems we're more accommodating to the heterosexual relationships before people are married. We say, well, that's, that's no big deal. It's not a biggie. Now, there was a time when 
There was considerable shame and guilt if a couple fell into temptation and had sex before they were married. But today, it seems that the only time we feel ashamed or guilty of sin is if our premarital sexual activity produces a pregnancy or perhaps a disease. And so to remind us and to caution us concerning this pervasive and powerful element in our lives, I want to review some of the uh, important teachings that the Bible sets forth on the subject of fornication and is a key admonishment here in 1 Corinthians, especially in chapter 6, because it was a problem in, in the church, because there was a kind of a laissez-faire, you know, no big deal attitude about that in the church in Corinth. So what's, what does the Bible teach you know, on fornication? Well, first of all, the first teaching is that fornication is sinful. Very simply, that it's sinful. Whenever the Bible mentions fornication, it's always in the context of sin. There's no such thing as fornication in moderation. You know, eating in moderation, yes, and you know, so on, exercise in moderation, so on. but fornication is never in, in moderation. There's no such thing as good fornication. It's always bad. It's intrinsically evil. Jesus himself specifically mentions this activity as being sinful, if there's kind of any doubt in our minds. He says in Matthew, not in 1 Corinthians, but he, obviously in Matthew chapter 15, he says, for out of the heart come evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornication, thefts, false witness, slanders, these are the things that defile a man. So note the various activities that he mentions along with fornication, what he lumps fornication in with, you know, murder, stealing, lying. So if you're not convinced about the seriousness of this particular sin, look at the company it's keeping in, in Jesus' estimation. No one, especially Christians, would doubt for a moment that these things are wrong. I mean, murder and stealing, lying, who would say that these, there's anything good about those things? We all agree they're immoral, they're evil, they're against God and they're against man as well. And yet, many times we doubt at times the seriousness of the sexual sin of fornication. That's, that's my point here. Make no mistake, fornication is a sin. It was a sin when Jesus taught about it to His apostles, it was still a sin when Paul was dealing with that problem with the church at Corinth. It's still a problem today in 2011. Okay, teaching number two. Teaching number two is all fornication is sinful. It's sinful and it's sinful all the time. Now this point may seem redundant to you, but there's a reason why I'm re-emphasizing it. Many Christians, especially younger ones, are beginning to make distinctions among the various sexual activities covered by the biblical term fornication. For example, they see as wrong and sinful those sexual practices that they feel are perverted and disgusting. You know, child molestation, young people, no, that's wrong, send that guy to jail. You know, or rape, are you kidding me? Send that guy to jail. And many times we, 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 young Christians will reject homosexuality and other forms of perversion. But certain sexual activity promoted and accepted by this society and the media for many young Christians, oh yeah, this is okay, they say. For example, sex between two people who may not be married but who love each other. Oh, well then that's okay. Who made up that rule? Who decided that that was okay? Or casual sex between friends that may not include intercourse, but permit oral sex or nudity or various ways of stimulating and satisfying each other's sexual feelings. Oh, well, that's okay. We agree. <laughs> In other words, there's this effort today to pick and choose within the different activities of fornication and make some parts of it acceptable. But the Bible doesn't do that. 
When Jesus condemned fornication, He condemned the child molester and the couple having sex before marriage in the same sentence. The only acceptable and blessed sexual union is that which God ordained between a man and a woman in marriage. All others are fornication, whether it be two lovers on a beach or the seller of pornography. It's, you know, well, okay, maybe one may be a crime, but in God's eyes, there, there, there aren't those mitigating circumstances, but we love each other. Yeah, okay, then get married. <laughs> we can't afford it. Well, then wait. Save your money. But we love each other. Then get married. But we can't afford a big wedding, so have a small wedding. I've had people say that to me and I've said, I'll do your wedding for nothing. I'll pay for your license. Oh, well, just a minute. Yeah, right. Yeah, it's not about the money, it's about the commitment. Since this is a class, I won't get on to preaching. We'll move along. Teaching number three, fornication is destructive. Now, some might be thinking, teaching number two is pretty tough. Who can accept it? And this is why there's teaching number three about the destructiveness of fornication. The problem is that we can more readily see the destructive and dehumanizing effect that rape has, for example, a terrible sin, a terrible violation, or the molestation of a child. Oh my, a terrible thing. To do. I mean, we see the destructiveness that this may have on a person. And this is why this form of fornication is easier to see as a sin, because it's so destructive, it's so violent. But many, especially the young, don't always see the destructive nature of premarital sex between heterosexuals. This, they figure, has no consequences and nothing could be further from the truth. This type of fornication is hard for them to see as sin. You know, in the movies and on TV, people are having sex all the time and they're happy and they're satisfied and it's fun. The problem here is that TV and movies are make-believe. In the real world, Premarital sex, whether it be full intercourse or partial sexual foreplay, has a negative, not a positive effect on people. You know, if the movies were true, and if what was happening in the movie was reality and true, then all these movie stars wouldn't be getting divorced all the time. <laughs> For example, an unplanned and unwanted Pregnancy. I mean, it's the old, isn't it the oldest story in the book? An unplanned and unwanted pregnancy. And yet, and I'm, I'm looking out there, haven't some of us either have experienced that in our lives or in our children's lives or families that we know? You know what I'm saying? Was that like a yippee, happy, oh great, my 16-year-old is pregnant, I'm so happy. I'm not sure about that. Of course we, we love the child, the child is innocent. What did the child do? We love the child, but I mean, are we really overjoyed that our 16-year-old is pregnant? Or that our 17-year-old son has impregnated a girl? I mean, are we really overjoyed about that situation? I don't think so. And sexually transmitted diseases. You know, young people say, oh, you're just trying to scare us. Well, let's go to the clinic and let's talk to the doctor and we'll see how scared you are. And of course, statistics, just statistics. I'm not preaching here, I'm just quoting statistics. For couples who have sex before marriage and then go on to marriage, their marriage is twice as likely to have problems and divorce than the couple who waits until marriage to engage in sex. Brothers and sisters, that's not doctrine, that's statistics. And it's statistics that are compiled by people who are not believers who have no ax to grind either way about religion. It's just statistics. And why these problems? Why should these problems occur? Well, despite sex education and condom distribution and the glorification of sex in the media and the ridiculing of Christian views on sex, despite all of this, 
fornication, especially the premarital sex kind of fornication, still causes problems. Why? Well, because God created sex and placed His boundaries on sex. You understand what I mean? He created this thing, this activity, and all that surrounds it called sex, but then He placed a boundary around it. God did this. God's the one that put the boundary, not man. Man is always trying to push the boundary further away, you know, take the boundary out of the way, always trying to do something with the boundary. But whenever man violates the boundary that God has placed around anything, but now we're talking about sexual activities, whenever, whenever man violates the boundary that God has placed around sexual activity, he will suffer. No matter what he thinks or says or does. Remember, the Bible says the wage of sin is, is death. If the Bible said the wage of sin is happiness, the wage of sin is freedom, the wage of sin is enlightenment, the wage of sin is whatever, well then maybe you know, we could believe it, but God said the wage of sin is death. Man is the one that says the wage of sin is happiness, fun, freedom, enlightenment. And that always gets us into all kinds of trouble. You see, you cannot cross God's boundaries or laws without consequences. That's the terrible reality that we learn as Christians, isn't it? It's sometimes suffocating, sometimes it's frightening. But once we get the idea, we cannot cross God's boundaries without consequences, especially sexual boundaries. So what are the boundaries? Well, God has said that within marriage, a man and a woman have a lifetime to enjoy, to create, to share, to explore human sexuality to their heart's content. I think that that's a pretty wide boundary. We have freedom to explore, to share, to create. We have that freedom within marriage. To me, I mean, that's all the way to the horizon. But this privilege and gift belongs exclusively to those who make a lifetime commitment to live as husband and wife. And, and you wonder why? Because it takes a lifetime to know each other. You know, you see a movie sometimes and the, the guy, you know, boy meets girl, they have a cute little meeting somewhere, a little talk, you know, it's really the screenwriters figure out all these little smart things that they say to each other, and 20 minutes later, in movie time, perhaps a week later, a day later, they're already you know, sharing a conjugal bed. And in the movie, it's all so great. But in real life, it's not so great. It's forbidden to all other people and those who cross this boundary are guilty of the sin of fornication in all of its many forms. God also says that there will be physical, which I mentioned before, and spiritual consequences for those who violate His command concerning fornication. In 1 Corinthians, Paul says in chapter 6, verse 18, he says, flee fornication. Every other sin that a man commits is outside the body, he says, but the sexually immoral man sins against his own body. That's why sexual sins are so painful, because you, the scar you're leaving is on you. You, you. you steal from somebody, the scar is on them. You took their stuff, you, you, you ransacked their house, you, you beat somebody up, the scar is on them. You know? But he says, when you sin sexually, the scar is on you. You're scarring yourself. So Paul here summarizes the dangerous physical consequences that result from sexual sin. He goes on in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 and 10, and he says, or do you not know that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God, do not be deceived, neither, and look who he puts first, fornicators, first. He puts fornicators even in front of idolaters. Fornicators, idolaters, 
uh, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers shall inherit the kingdom of God. A lot of people, you know, modern translators, modern critics, you know, they say, oh well, you know, Paul didn't really mean that about homosexuals because that was just in those times people had those ideas, but ideas have evolved. And they say the same thing about fornication, but look, have ideas evolved about uh, stealing, or being an alcoholic, or thieves. So this, these, this list here is not subject to culture, it's just innate sinfulness that men and women have since the beginning of time. So this is pretty clear as to the sinfulness and the seriousness of fornication. He puts it first. So Paul teaches that those guilty of this sin will be lost, will not go to heaven. That's how serious it is. So we should seriously an action that has the power to both ruin our physical and emotional health as well as condemn our souls to hell. I think that's pretty serious stuff. Satan has seduced us well into thinking that fornication is normal. It's actually healthy. It's even something better than purity and self-control and obedience. Oh no, are you kidding me? Purity, self-control, obedience, that's for losers, that's for chumps. Let's not be fooled, Paul says, do not be deceived. Don't be fooled. Well, who do you think is going to try to fool us? The world's going to try to fool us. Satan will try to fool us. We'll try to fool ourselves. But Paul says, don't be deceived. Fornication in all of its forms is an offense to God because it crosses the boundary which He has set for human sexuality. And He's put that boundary there not to take anything away from us. He's put that boundary there so that we can have what He's given us to its fullest measure. That's why He's put the boundary there. Let's not be fooled. Fornication in all of its forms is destructive to one's body and emotions. It's the cause for losing one's soul. It's a serious thing. <clears throat> Excuse me. You know, people in the world write their own rules when it comes to sex. As Christians, we follow the rules written by God concerning this and other matters. Okay, teaching number four, we're winding down here. I've said it before. Flee fornication, run away from it. If I were to summarize all of what the Bible says about dealing with fornication in our lives, I could not do it better than what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18, run away, flee. In today's words, stay away, run away from every form of sexual sin. Every person has, for whatever reason, weaknesses in the area of sexual feelings or desires or expression. Everybody, I've said this before, everybody has a different sexual character. Some are tempted to exhibitionism. You know, they want to show themselves. For others it's pornography, they want to look. And for still others it may be the constant lure to be unfaithful. And of course the most common form is various activities in premarital sex. Because of our sinful nature, we are drawn to any number of forbidden sexual practices under the general heading of fornication. It's natural for us to be drawn to these things because we're human, we're sinful. So how do we as Christians deal with these temptations to sin sexually? A couple of things to remember. Number one, let's remember who we are. We're not animals regulated solely by our feelings and our instincts. We're not unbelievers. We're not slaves to sin, to whatever stimulus Satan puts in the world. We're not those people. We're Christians. We're washed in the blood of Christ. We're powered by the Spirit. We're instructed by God's word. We're the people who can hear this kind of sermon and hear it for what it is. Our goal is not sexual gratification. Our goal is much higher, much more satisfying than this. 
Our goal is to please the God who saved us from sin and with whom we will live in purity forever. Therefore, Paul says, this time in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9, 10, he says, therefore also we have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to Him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. You know, we'll be judged, God knows, we can't hide it from Him. So sex is for this life, and it's a good thing within the boundaries that God has given us. But it's for this life, and it's for this world. We, as Christians, we're made to live in this world, but we're also made to live in the world to come. Let's not forget that. Number two, remember who we belong to. You know, the argument for much illicit sex is that this is my body and so long as it's consensual, I can, I can have whatever sex, sex I desire. So long as I want to do it and so long as I don't hurt anybody, I can do whatever I want to do. But this argument is just false because it's based on a false premise. And the false premise is my body belongs to me. That's a false premise. In reality, our bodies are given to us by God as a vessel to carry our eternal souls, which are also given to us by God. Just because non-believers reject this idea doesn't make it untrue. Christians understand that their life is a stewardship of the body given to them by God and redeemed by the blood of Christ. As a matter of fact, our bodies belong to God and they belong to God twice over. Once when He created us and once again when He saved us through Jesus Christ. He owns us twice over, not just once over. Paul says that our body is not for fornication, but for the Lord. Again, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 13. Our bodies belong to God, and we must use our bodies to serve and honor Him. Again, within the boundaries of marriage, we're serving God when we fulfill our partner's needs and desires. I mean, that's part of God's plan. We can serve and honor God with our sexual activity, but only when we keep it within the boundaries that He has set, otherwise we dishonor ourselves and we dishonor Him. Number three, remember to flee. Remember to flee. Since sexual power is so strong, we need to remember that the best way to deal with temptation is to run away. I used to say to my daughters, I trust you up here. I trust you up here because I know you know, because I know you know what I've taught you, so I trust you up here, but I don't trust you down here because you're young, because you're human, because you have feelings, and feelings sometimes overpower this, overpowers this. And so let's make sure we set boundaries in their dating lives and so on and so forth. Remember to flee, is what I used to say to them in essence. Don't put yourself into situations with people or activities or dress in such a way where you know you'll be tempted. And do decide and declare ahead of time what your boundaries are to yourself and to others. I think I mentioned this in another class about our daughter Julia when she was in the Marine Corps. Cute little blonde, blue eyes. You know, she didn't look like a Marine. You know, she was a girly girl. And she used to have a lot of people wanting to date her you know, in the Marine Corps. Can you imagine? So I asked her once, Julia, how do you deal with all of that? You know, guys hitting on you, blah, blah. Oh, she says, well, I have a spiel. I said, oh, you have a spiel? Yeah, she says, I have a speech I make. I said, really, what's your speech? She says, well, if somebody asks me to go out on a date or something like that, we have the talk. I said, what do you say to them? She says, well, she says, I say to them, look, we'll go out, I'm happy to go out with you, you know, get to know you, whatever. But there are a couple of rules. And the guy said, oh, sure, rules? No, I'm all about rules, I'm a Marine. You know? And she says, okay, rule number one, under no, under no circumstances, there's absolutely no way in the world that I will have sex with you. In any way, shape, or form, it ain't going to happen. I mean, nothing's going to happen to make me have sex with you unless we're married. 
Rule number two, we will not drink alcohol. We will not take drugs together. We will not do that. There is no situation that will happen that will enable me to, to do that. And number three, you will never hit me. You will never hurt me because my brother is also in the Marines and he'll take care of your blank. <laughs> she was a Marine then. She had a different vocabulary. At that. that was the talk. That was her way of setting the boundaries. And I said, you must not have gotten a lot of dates. She said, no, but the ones that I had were fun. And she found a guy who was willing to go along with those things. A wonderful man that she ended up marrying. So remember to flee. Do decide and declare ahead of time what your boundaries are to yourself and to others. We're weak sinners, we easily fall, so take precautions and head for the hills at the first sign of temptation. And then the last thing, remember heaven. Remember heaven. The hardest thing for people, especially young people, to do is to take the long view. But the issue of sexual sin is all about taking the short view over the long view. Sexual sin is short-lived, a passing passion, usually over as quickly as it takes to, to be lured in. But the consequences are usually felt over a very long period of time. Only takes a moment to create a child, it takes a lifetime to raise it. Remember the promise of heaven. Remember the peacefulness and the joy of a clear conscience. Remember the strength that comes from doing what is right. When you're not sure about the situation, ask yourself, will this help me or will this hinder me from going to heaven? Well, that has a very, a very cold water effect on <laughs> if the young woman said to the young man who was getting a little too passionate, is this going to help us to get to heaven or, or not? You know, I have a feeling that might be a cold blanket on that situation. <laughs> So you've probably heard these ideas today, before. Certainly you, you won't hear them on radio or television concerning sex and that's because what you're hearing today is what the Spirit says about sex and what you see in the world is what the flesh wants you to hear about sex. As Christians, young and old, remember what the Spirit says concerning the sin of fornication. I need to quit here. One, very quickly, fornication is a sin in all of its forms. Number two, no matter how appealing and acceptable the world makes it, it's always destructive. Number three, because of our weak flesh, we need to make every effort to avoid people and situations that will lead us there. And one last thing I want to remind you of this morning, fornication, like any other sin, can be forgiven. Paul says of those who were guilty of fornication, and such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. It's very true that sexual sin wounds us deeply, but the blood of Christ and the grace of Christ is able to go as deep to heal those wounds and to set us back again to have a clear and clean conscience. One last story. There was a young woman that came to see me once that I was going to marry. I mean, I wasn't going to marry her. I was going to perform her wedding. And she had a secret. And her secret was that she had had an abortion before she had become a Christian and so on and so forth. And she felt very badly about that. And she was just, you know, it was a sexual sin. And then that sexual sin grew to even a worse sin. And she wanted to know if she could be if she could wear a white wedding dress, because she was marrying a nice, wonderful young Christian man and so on and so forth. And I said, yes, absolutely, because when you confessed Christ, when you went into the waters of baptism, God washed away all of your sins, purified your soul and your heart. You are, you are a virgin in His eyes. And if you're in a virgin in His eyes, you can wear that white wedding dress with a clear conscience. Well, that's the lesson, uh, less textual, more topical this morning. We'll continue next week with more lessons from 1 Corinthians. Thank you for your attention.